So I'm going to talk about embedded processors. We're going to provide a, a brief view of the processors used in separate physical systems, embedded systems. Uh, we're going to talk about a few different types of processors. And um, at the end, we're going to talk about parallelism uh, that's uh, supported by the processors. So first, how do we view of different processors? Um, of course, you can you know, say this processor is from vendor A, that processor, processor is from vendor B. Uh, but overall, uh, these processors from different vendors, uh, they may share um, you know, common characteristics. And one of the major characteristics is the instruction set architecture. Instruction set architecture, or ISA in short, uh, is a abstraction of the processor or abstraction of the uh, machine as seen by the programmer. Um, another way to understand this is ISA defines the um, assembly level instructions that a programmer may use in their uh, assembly language programs. So essentially it defines what kind of registers are there for the programmers to use and how we should write instructions and to operate on these registers and also memory um, locations. Um, so it's um, very common that you have a few different vendors, um, you, the processor, their processors use the same instruction set I'll give you an example. So x86 is one of the most popular instruction set, not necessarily uh, in embedded systems, but in the computing domain in general, you can find these processors, these instruction sets in processors that are used in your laptop, your desktop or data center servers. And they may from different vendors and two major vendors are Intel and AMD. Both of them produce processors that support x86 instruction set. Um, as a result, um, if you write an assembly language program, chances are you can write, you can use the same program to run on an Intel processor and later on an AMD processor because they share the same instruction set. Um, so for programmer, they only have to know one instruction set if the program knows that uh, the design will eventually use this type, this type of processors that with this, this particular instruction set architecture. Um, to give you another example, uh, for Arduino um, platforms, uh, these boards, they have different um, models of these boards or variants of these boards. Uh, we are using the Mega 2560. And uh, last time I showed you a design that used a smaller Arduino board, uh, the Arduino Uno. And these two boards, they use the same, um, they, they, they actually use different processors, uh, slightly different processors. But uh, these two processors uh, following the same instruction set, this AVR instruction set. So the programs that you write, if you write in assembly language, chances are you can run the program, majority of the program on a different AVR processor. Okay, so that was about the instruction set architecture. The next thing, next view is the microarchitecture. Microarchitecture is uh, not uh, to be seen or visible or used by the programmers. It's more about um, in the chip design, when the vendor design and manufacture this chip, what kind of physical realization of the ISA is taken, takes place underneath the instruction set. So the microarchitecture uh, defines, um, for example, do you use out of order execution? Do you do branch prediction? Uh, these type of things that's um, 
more related to um, performance uh, improvement of a particular design or power consumption optimization, uh, but it will not change the instruction set architecture. So it will not affect the programs that you write in assembly language. So on this slide, there's one more question. Can one instruction set be realized using more than one microarchitecture? And the answer is yes. As I just explained, for the same instruction set, um, you can implement um, this particular processor using different microarchitectures. Uh, you may use one microarchitecture for um, the purpose of high performance, and you can you know, redesign this chip uh, using some very efficient power um, optimization techniques to reduce the power consumption of the chip, but still you maintain the same instruction set architecture. And that's uh, still possible. And in fact, that's very uh, common in the industry. So hopefully uh, these several points uh, give you some idea about the views of these processors. Instruction set variety. Uh, for general computing, uh, there are different kinds of uh, instruction set architectures. Um, you can, you know, you've probably heard of uh, x86 and ARM. Uh, so those are two major instruction sets and um, also AVR, uh, the one that we use in Arduino. Um, and there are many uh, different instruction architectures, instruction set architectures. Um, so there are, you know, the costs related to instruction set architecture specialization uh, will be, for example, if you want to um, port any uh, applications that written in assembly language, uh, it's going to be almost impossible that you port the same program from one instruction set to another instruction set. Let's say you write a instruction uh, assembly language program um, for a x86 processor, and you want to run the same program on a ARM processor, you essentially have to rewrite the program. But that's the case only for assembly language programming. If you go up a higher programming language level, C or C++ or Java, um, the compilers for these programs, for these languages, uh, handles a lot of the backend uh, mapping uh, from the um, syntax and um, semantics of the program to the machine's instruction set. So for those cases, uh, for the high level language programs, uh, you don't have to worry about the challenges of porting from one platform to another platform. Um, for the embedded computing domain, there are a, a variety of instruction set architectures um, you know, I mentioned a few ARM-based microprocessors and AVR-based uh, microcontrollers, um, and also uh, from the uh, microchip, uh, also they have the uh, PIC microcontrollers. There's a lot of different embedded processors using different instruction set architectures. So in an embedded domain, uh, the benefits of these different instruction sets are, um, you know, generally for um, small um, programs uh, because for specific instruction set, they can be very compact. Uh, so to implement specific um, functions, you only need um, a, a few instructions. And from one instruction set to another instruction set, you may see difference in terms of the program size. And also depends on the registers that they have. Some operations may be efficient in one instruction set uh, versus the other instruction set. So that's why you have uh, a variety of instruction sets uh, in the embedded domain and you can choose th those from and you can consider together 
with the um, performance and power consumption of the processors to make a decision, you know, which architecture you want to go with. Now here, we just want to briefly compare different processor characteristics. Um, for the general com purpose computing domain, what do you want? And for the embedded computing domain, what do you want? What's the difference? You can come up with all kinds of answers to these questions. But in general, for the general purpose computing, you want uh, your processor to be um, you know, powerful, uh, efficient in computing. Um, you want it, the, the processor to be um, you know, power efficient. Um, but for general purpose computing, you will consider performance, um, you know, you will weigh performance more than the power consumption. Um, but, you know, it, it's always a, a balance whether, you know, um, you, how much you want to sacrifice on the power consumption to get higher performance. When you have a laptop, um, you have um, some general purpose processors in the laptop. Uh, based on Intel's processors or AMD processors. Um, you can get higher performance. You can have a processor that runs at 3.x gigahertz. Um, well, at least at when the processor is put into the turbo mode, um, you will then have to consider, okay, if I run the process at that high speed, what will be the power consumption? Uh, how much time my battery of the laptop can last. So that's always a, a trade-off there. Um, for embedded computing, um, there are even more considerations. Uh, one is the power efficiency, uh, because you tend to have you know, embedded mobile devices and you want this device to uh, be powered by battery. So the energy efficiency is very important. Uh, you want that probably the most. Um, and also you want this um, processor probably um, you know, proficient in digital signal processing. If that's something that you do, um, maybe a, a, a DVD player or something. Um, so that's uh, the functionality that you will uh, want to have uh, to be able to um, run a specific task on this processor very efficiently. And also for embedded computing, you want to lower the cost. Uh, so the cheaper the processor, then that's more beneficial. So there are a lot of different um, characteristics of the processors in terms of performance, power, uh, programmability, uh, acceleration of certain tasks, and cost. So all these things that uh, will becoming factors to, for you to make a decision. Um, when we talk about microcontrollers, uh, in our context, we specifically refer to those processors uh, sometimes called as system on chip or SOC. So these microcontrollers, they have a CPU core uh, on the chip, and also it has uh, you know, a significant amount of memory um, for um, storing program and data and some are volatile and some are non-volatile. And on this chip, you have a lot, a lot more uh, components than a general purpose processor. For example, timers and IO ports uh, or a UR controller or U even USB controller on the same chip. Um, so this is uh, so-called system on the chip. So all the things you see here on the list, um, you don't have to have these components separately on the same um, PCB board. Instead, uh, in, in uh, a modern microcontrollers, you have everything uh, on this list uh, embedded in the same chip. Um, so,
Well, uh, so the question um, that showed up on the chat is uh, Arduino Mega 2560 that we use is a microprocessor or a microcontroller. Uh, I would you know, say it's a microcontroller um, just because it has um, all these different components on the same chip. So we call it a system on chip. Uh, in our context, we really call the microprocessors like those um, um, ARM-based uh, or uh, x86-based um, processors that are not specifically for uh, embedded applications. Uh, but you know, I have to say that the 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 boundary between microprocessors and microcontrollers are getting um, blurry. Um, it, it's uh, you, people can say you know these two interchangeably, uh, especially when they talk about microcontrollers. Uh, some people say it's a microprocessor, but not the other way around. Um, um, I would say the microcontroller is more. Uh, leading towards the embedded domain. Uh, so it's going to be um, a lot more components on the chip, even much simpler. For example, the CPU core will be simpler. The data width sometimes 8-bit uh, or 16-bit. Um, some amount of memory, uh, but with a lot of different components on the chip, timers, UART, uh, USB, uh, I.O. ports. So when you see something like this, uh, we we call them microcontrollers. Okay, um, and microcontrollers typically for limited energy usage. So the power consumption, uh, the low power um, is a uh, desired feature. Also for these chips, they can uh, put themselves into sleep mode uh, that will even lower the power consumption. And there are many different applications of uh, microcontrollers or embedded microprocessors. Okay, in industry control, uh, there are many situations you want to have a sequence of operations. So in a manufacturing um, pipeline, you may have different vault, uh, valve or different, um, you know, um, um, you know, devices that you want to turn on and off in a sequence. And you will need to use these type of machinery or uh, a physical system to um, change the quantities uh, of you know, uh, actuators or uh, based on the sensory input, you want to affect the, the process of the manufacturing um, pipeline or platform. So the, in these kind of situations, uh, uh, people can use so-called uh, programmable logic controllers or PLCs. PLCs is a unique uh, categories of microcontroller system. Uh, they are used primarily for industrial automation. Uh, they are intended for continuous operation and also very hostile environment, for example, high very high temperature or very low temperature, noisy or strong magnetic interference. Uh, so these hostile environment can pose challenges to um, the other type of microcontroller or microprocessors, uh, which are you know, designed to operate in a pretty normal environment. So for, for PLCs, uh, these type of controllers uh, they are programmed using so-called ladder logic. Um, you, use, you often use a specific um, uh, uh, integrated design interface uh, provided by the vendor. It's different from you writing uh, some language code, uh, but they are um, you know, basically stitching up these different logics to form the control sequence. Um, and so that you can use to um, Define any actions on relays and switches. Um, so for this class, uh, we're not going to focus on PLC. So I will just give you such a short introduction. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, you can uh, get some reading online. Um, but we here uh, we mostly talk about embedded uh, controllers, embedded processors. Um, 
I'm going to talk about the signal processors or signal processing, uh, digital signal processing processors uh, first. And um, in the second half of this lecture, I will give you uh, specific um, examples on the microcontrollers. Um, so embedded signal processing is uh, very common. Um, it's um, um, used in cases for, you know, process any signals, um, sound waves, uh, magnetic waves, or, um, um, you know, images. Um, and these embedded computers are very frequently used to control a process or uh, otherwise to process signals. There are a lot of different signals coming from the physical world and the, from the cyber perspective, we need to, uh, of course, input, um, read these signals, feed them into the system and then be able to process them. So as we show on the figure, in, in the figure on the right, that uh, we have a physical plant. Um, it, it, it's a physical world. It has a lot of sensors, saturators, and we will get the data from the sensors and uh, apply them in a controller. Uh, so that's what we uh, are designing uh, using microcontrollers or um, DSPs. And using the output from the system, we will then um, control the physical process, uh, maybe control the actuators uh, or apply any actions. So in this process, uh, we often use so-called filters. And we'll uh, go through a few slides to um, um, give you an idea of what is a filter and why it's important, and especially how we can leverage um, processors to um, perform such operations as a filters. So this is a, a circuit that you may have seen in your prior um, you know, uh, circuit theory class. Uh, this is a very simple passive uh, low pass filter. Uh, we have a resistor and connected to a capacitor in series. And we have a input signal VI and we have a output signal uh, V out. Uh, so VO, that's the output. Uh, so what this circuit does is really to um, apply some processing, this so-called filtering uh, on the input signal, uh, which assume it's a uh, sinusoidal uh, is signal that will um, carry out the different uh, frequencies of uh, signals. And this passive filter, uh, low pass filter will be able to filter out uh, the frequency band that beyond um, certain cutoff frequency. Um, so this is the um, figure that try to characterize this circuit. Uh, what we're showing here is so-called frequency response. Uh, the frequency response uh, figure shows that uh, if we look at the uh, amplitude that coming out of the circuit, uh, compare that with the um, input signal. Uh, the, on the X axis is the frequency uh, that you may have on the signal and the Y is the am amplitude uh, in um, related to the uh, original input signal. Um, what we see here, the general trend is that uh, as we said, this is a low pass filter. So we, we expect that the uh, amplitude will uh, gradually decrease as the frequency increases. And at some point, in fact, for this particular circuit, if you calculate the cutoff frequency, it's about uh, one kilohertz, it's 999 or 994, something like that. Um, so this is the frequency we call it cutoff frequency. Uh, here, the beyond this um, point, uh, the signal will be, um, the output signal will be greatly dampened or re reduced. Um, so this is the result of this low, low pass filter. 
Now, one thing we want to uh, show is uh, the step response. For step response is essentially when you have a voltage zero as an input and momentarily you apply that or change that to a uh, um, voltage of you know, VDD. So how will the um, output respond? And because as you know that when we have a such a sudden change and the, um, the capacitor will uh, go through a very dynamic process. Uh, at the very beginning, the, uh, um, the the voltage here is zero, and then it will um, it will uh, accumulate charges, and then the voltage will gradually increase. As a result, the difference between this input and output uh, the, uh, is going to be reduced gradually. And then as a result, the current going through uh, on the circuit is reduced. So what we show here is essentially how the uh, output um, respond um, when your input suddenly change from zero to one. And of course you can see this is a, a very dynamic progress uh, process. Uh, you, you can see as the time uh, goes forward, the um, voltage on the output uh, gradually reaches the uh, same uh, voltage as the input side. Another characteristic about this low pass filter is the impulse response. The impulse response uh, is uh, a function that reflects the um, kind of the transfer characteristic of the circuit. Uh, in a sense that it estimates the uh, distortions uh, of this uh, circuit for the signals passing through it. And this distortions, it's also uh, related to time. And as we start, um, the distortion is gonna go uh, spike. You know, as, as we go forward, it gradually goes down because the dynamic changes is uh, not as uh, significant as, as before. So this impulse response is try, tries to capture the um, transfer uh, effect of this circuit applied to the input signals. One takeaway message from this um, uh, impulse response is that uh, the uh, actual output uh, that you see on the output side uh, is a, um, a transfer function that we applied to the input signal. So this is the transfer function will be applied to whatever signal that you apply uh, on the input side. And the way we determine the actual output signal is to do a signal con convolution process. So this convolution process will apply this impulse response function, uh, which is determined by the filter itself so this is the HT. And with the uh, actual input signal, F, at FT here. So this is the input signal. And this uh, sign here, this is the convolution operation. And this essentially tells uh, what, how we can uh, determine the actual output uh, based on the input signal and the uh, time dependent uh, transfer function uh, given by this filter. So this is the um, principle of operation of this low pass filter. So what we saw earlier was uh, what will happen if we have actual circuit that built into our system uh, to apply this filtering on the input signal. Now, I wanna make it clear that what we wanna do using a processor is to um, what we want to do using a processor is to basically, oh, let me go back a little bit. Instead of using a analog um, circuitry, 
we want to use a processor to apply a similar operation um, on this input signal. As a result, we expect that the processor will give us um, roughly the same output um, voltage amplitude um, as if we have a analog circuitry. So that's the purpose of our digital signal processing that we want to run this signal, signal processing function using a processor. So in the next few slides, I'm going to explain how we can approximate this process and uh, uh, what's the implications on our processor design. So first of all, we need to um, sample the impulse response. So the impulse response is this uh, curve that we saw earlier. The, um, we want to use the microprocessor to be able to capture this transfer function, uh, which you know, describes the uh, filtering effect applied by this filter. One way we can do is we will do some samples. As you can see, um, even we know that this uh, original impulse response function is a continuous uh, function, uh, we here only sample a few points. And we chose to use uh, this 20, 250 microsecond as a sampling um, period um, that gives us a sampling rate of four kilohertz. So we use these um, samples and specifically we can see uh, we have a few uh, values that we will get from this curve. Um, you know, the first one is 6,250. The second one is 1310 and then 275, and then 58, and then 12. So essentially we can do this sampling to get uh, a few data points. Uh, when we sample, we get um, a few sample values. We can actually scale them uh, to make the uh, computation simpler, more efficient, uh, because overall this is a linear process. We can later scale them back. So what we do here is we take the sample of values and then we scale them uh, down by a hundred and then uh, run the result to the nearest integer. Also, we need to sample the input signal uh, because we are gonna um, use the convolution function to uh, apply on the input signal. Uh, so we'll do the sampling uh, even though the input signal uh, might be a continuous signal. And we'll use the sampling rate of the same as the uh, impulse response. Uh, so for this case, it will be four kilohertz. Now here's a question, you know, what's the requirement on the input signal? Uh, I'm asking about the input signal, specifically about the, the um, frequency of the input signal uh, because the sampling rate is at two kilohertz um, and we should not have a um, signal that's uh, input signal that's higher than and two kilohertz um, because we need to at least double of the frequency of the signal to be able to sample correctly without aliasing. Okay, then uh, we can then apply this convolution function uh, um, both these input signal and impulse response. And what you see here, the first line of the formula is the um, uh, convolution operation in the continuous domain. Uh, we have this integral uh, operation to uh, calculate that. And this F tau is the um, input signal at uh, that tau moment and uh, H is the um, impulse response uh, at the uh, at T minus tau moment. So we're talking about the, the past um, a few um, intervals. And then in uh, discrete form, we will uh, simplify the original formula with this uh, 
a, uh, the second line of the formula. Here, the capital N is the number of samples uh, of the impulse responses. Um, essentially, we are looking at, uh, at this point, uh, when you have a um, uh, input signal or, or the past N input signals and with the corresponding um, impulse response samples, uh, we can apply this um, you know, multiplication and then do summation to calculate the uh, output uh, voltage. And then we can implement uh, this using so-called the uh, finite impulse response filter. And in this case, we chose N capital N to be four. That means we're gonna use a four tab uh, finite impulse response filter. You will see shortly what is uh, what does four tab mean, uh, but essentially mathematically, you can see that we are using the past four uh, samples to uh, calculate the, uh, the um, value of the output. This VI is the input and uh, H0, 1, 2, 3 are the uh, sampled points values from the impulse response function. And this uh, VK, K minus one, K minus two, K minus three are the um, um, samples of the past uh, before this current uh, data point on the input. So we'll move forward by replacing the uh, coefficient with the values that we sampled from the uh, impulse response function and scale down by 100. So we have 63, 13, three and one, and we apply that those numbers uh, in this final calculation. So this is what we have as the uh, filter structure. Um, what we have here is uh, several uh, coefficient numbers uh, that we sampled from the impulse response function. Uh, this here is actually a one, but it's up omitted because you know you multiply one, that's you know the same thing. Um, this sigma, uh, first of all, this is um, this uh, symbol here represents a multiplication operation, and this symbol represents a um, accumulation or addition function. And this delay is added to uh, get the um, samples from the past. So as you can see that for the input signal, you will go through these several stages, um, multiply, accumulate, uh, with delay, multiply, accumulate, and so on. And eventually will accumulate all the uh, four terms and then get the output of the voltage. So if we do that, uh, so we'll um, be able to plot the frequency response. If you recall at the very beginning, we had a frequency response diagram that shows the original uh, low pass filter circuit. Uh, how does that um, apply to uh, the input uh, signals? When we compare these two, we see that uh, the one we used with microprocessors uh, has similar trend. However, it does not follow exactly what we have seen on the analog design. Well, you can expect this is uh, probably gonna happen because we uh, did a lot of assumption or simplification when we um, process this signal. First of all, we only use four samples of the impulse response whereas the original circuitry, that impulse response function is a continuous function. Uh, but you know, for our design, we use four samples, which makes the uh, FR filter, uh, it's very simple with only four tabs. And as a result, that uh, degrades the filter performance. So um, our first step is that we um, use approach uh, using digital processors to apply filtering on any signals, um, try to emulate the original analog design. 
even though this does not, you know, um, match exactly the uh, analog and circuitry, but we may be able to improve this performance by using uh, different designs. Uh, when we use uh, more samples, that's one way to do it. And in that case, the filter uh, will be using a different number of coefficients. Um, and also uh, we can, um, so um, we can increase the number of um, tabs uh, so that instead of four, we can have a lot more of these um, Accum uh, multiplication operators with more coefficient and accumulators so that we can get uh, much closer to what we have in an analog circuit. So in this design, uh, we essentially have two major operations, multiply, that's multiply with these coefficients and then accumulate, so that's uh, for every single stage. So for multiply, we need a very fast integer uh, operator. And also for accumulation, we need uh, large integer uh, adders and accumulations because the uh, eventual value could be um, you know, um, pretty big. And we would like to have both uh, for our design. Uh, and that's exactly what we have in the digital uh, signal processors or DSPs, where we have the so-called um, multiply accumulation operation operators. Um, so DSP, digital signal processors, provides fast and efficient multiply accumulation instruction. Um, and typically it's uh, included a relatively large accumulator uh, to accommodate the uh, multiplication result. Um, also, they use Harvard memory access architecture, which I'll explain later. Harvard architecture really means that you have separate program memory and data memory. And they also provide ways to uh, automatically increment addressing a mode uh, addresses so you can uh, quickly get to the next sample uh, without having to uh, specifically increment the pointers to access data in memory. They may also support circular buffer. Uh, that's going to be uh, efficient implementation of the delay lines. Uh, and also they may support zero overlap, overhead loops uh, when you have uh, such a uh, large number of uh, loops to operate on these samples. Okay, so what we explained earlier was the um, filter design using digital processors uh, so, so that we don't have to have a uh, analog circuitry. We can use a microcontroller to perform the same operation. That will give us a lot more programmability. We can choose different sample efficiency. We can apply to uh, different input signals to emulate different designs of filters, not only low pass filters, but in some cases high pass filters and, and so on. All right, so uh, that was a discussion about digital signal processors. Um, in the next few slides, I wanna briefly talk about parallelism and the concurrency. Parallelism and concurrency are important concepts related to um, multiple tasks being executed. Embedded computing applications typically do more than one thing at a time because the, um, the complexity of the cyber physical system, you know, by nature, there are a lot of things happening at the same time and you, you uh, will desire your uh, physical, um, your, um, your cyber systems uh, will be able to support um, you know, the computation of different tasks. But I want to differentiate two concepts. Uh, one is concurrent, one is parallel. Uh, you may see these two concepts, two terms in different textbooks and papers. Uh, they refer to different things, even they are uh, quite similar. 
both of them are talking about you know, multiple tasks. But when we say concurrent, uh, we are talking about uh, when tasks are conceptually executed uh, simultaneously. Um, you can think about as a kind of a, a, a logical per se. Um, if two tasks both are being uh, both started but they have not finished, you can call them concurrent. But when this uh, concurrent doesn't mean that they are being uh, executed at the exact same time. At the instruction level, they may um, execute one after another, maybe take turns. They don't have to be um, executed exactly at the same time. And that's what we, why, well, when we call them concurrent. In contrast, when tasks are said to be parallel, uh, they are physically executed at the same time. Which means that from the hardware perspective, from the processor, per, pro, processor perspective, you have to have more than one um, processor course in order to execute more than one task at the same time. And that's not the case for concurrent or concurrency. So when we say parallel, we really mean that for these multiple tasks, they have to be executed uh, on different processors at the same time. Whereas the concurrent concept is not a very strict, it just means that um, processes are um, you know, in progress. Um, they, uh, both of them or all of them have not finished it. Uh, they can proceed at the same time. Okay, um, about the uh, take, uh, taking advantages of this parallelism in applications or uh, the hardware architectures to improve performance, uh, that's a, you know, a big topic. Um, what we want to discuss here is just give you some idea, you know, what can we expect when we have um, you know, parallelism in the application or um, multiple cores that in the processor that you, that you can use. Various current architectures seeks to improve for performance by finding and exploiting potentials of parallelist execution. If you find there are two parts of your program that can be executed at the same time, and you have resources, for example, you have two cores or more cores in a processor, then you have a ch chance to improve the performance. And um, it, with multiple processors, you often improves the processing throughput. Let's say you um, have, um, you know, you have, you have a digital camera, let's say, and you are going to take uh, continuous shots uh, for certain you know, sports um, scenes. So you can hold the, 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 pre, um, the shutter and then the camera will start firing up and uh, you know, taking pictures continuously until you release the shutter button. Um, so some cameras, they say, okay, they can do continuous uh, taking pictures for, you know, um, 10 pictures per second or, uh, you know, 15 pictures per second, which is pretty fast. Um, but we're really talking about the um, throughput uh, in a sense that you can expect that you will uh, you can take this 15 pictures uh, in one second, um, but that does not translate that you will, um, uh, it takes one, one second or half second to finish the processing of one single picture. So the throughput and latency are not always the same. If you have multiple cores, you have multiple um, processing units, you can improve the processing throughput because essentially you can assign different tasks on separate processors. But it does not always mean that you will um, take shorter time to finish processing one picture. Uh, so that's one thing I want to just clarify when we talk about this parallel execution. Um, 
One other point is that many embedded applications rely on results being produced at predictable regular rates. Uh, so the result must be available at the right time. This is especially true for real-time systems. When we define real-time system, we're saying that uh, if you uh, get this input signal, you have to finish processing within uh, 500 milliseconds. So that's one um, example how you define this um, um, constraint. There are hard real-time systems and soft real-time system. Hard real-time systems are where you have to follow exactly the schedule. You have to get your uh, input signal within this first 250 millisecond, process it in the next 500 millisecond, and then you know, uh, apply control on the actuators in the next 100 millisecond. And next round is goes the same. And that's, that's a good example of hard real-time. So everything has to be timed precisely and your system will go on like that. If there's any violation of these time, timing constraints, then the system is you know, gonna be uh, um, reporting a serious error or, or shutdown or do some drastic um, you know, last resort to, to, um, to uh, tolerate the, this, to protect, the, um, protect from any um, serious consequences. On the other hand, you, you can have soft real-time systems so even though you, you may have such timing constraints on different tasks, but uh, you know, if, if things don't go exactly as the schedule, it's probably fine. You can just you know, put that into the log saying this um, thing happened and your system can go on. So timing is really important for uh, many of the embedded systems. Uh, some hard real-time system timing is kind of the lifeline. If timing violation, occurs, then the system is gonna, gonna crash. Uh, but some other cases may not be the, the, the same. Um, parallelism, um, we have temp temporal parallelism, uh, you know, or pipelining. So you can, um, you know, um, apply, you can run the task in different stages and uh, in different stages, you can, um, um, in different stages of the pipeline, you apply uh, operations on one piece of data and then the other pipeline stage, you will do something else. So that goes along the time axis. Special, uh, spatial parallelism uh, really is about um, uh, how you can execute multiple instructions at the same time uh, using either multi-core, or very long instruction word where you can embed different instructions in this long word or super scalar machines uh, processors that you will schedule uh, multiple instructions so they can be on the fly uh, being executed uh, before you know, any of them are committed or finished. So those are more related to uh, some um, design options uh, for uh, microprocessors and microcontrollers.